So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Well, hello, my friends. Welcome back to Montessori Creativity and the Meaning of Life. I just finished up a series on love poems to God, and I have gotten amazing responses from you out there um, with uh, this idea of like just being in the beautiful language of poetry. And so for many years, I have wanted to write my own poetry. And I think the only way you really get inspired to write poetry, if you've never done it before, and I've never done it in a very organized fashion, is you have to read a lot of poetry. And you have to read poetry from many, many different poets so that you start to understand the rhythm of a poem. And then you can take that and influence it with your own rhythm. I read a read a book called um, The Burning Word, and the artist, or I should say, well, she is an artist, but she's an author as well, um, Judith Kunst. And what she said was, when she was in school uh, taking a writing, uh, some writing classes in a, a writing program, um, the the professor would give. Um, the students four or five different options. But then he would say if, for example, there was um, a passage from the Old Testament or the New Testament of the Bible, he would say to her, don't pick one of those the passages from the Old or the New Testament, you already write in that rhythm. And so that's what I find that I do. When I sit down, because I've read the Psalms so many times, what ends up coming out is something that sounds like the Psalms. Now, there's nothing bad about that, obviously, but I wanted to really expand the way that I use language. And poetry really is such a way to um, expand and and just deepen the way in which you put words together. So this is what I thought I'd do, and I hope you enjoy this. I figured I would take maybe five to seven poems from various poets, and I would share them with you. And in that way, we can journey as well into this luxurious world of poetic language. So let's go ahead and get started. Episode one of The Journey Into More Poetry. We'll start with one by Billy Collins called Introduction to Poetry. I ask them to take a poem and hold it up to the light, like a color shade, and press an ear against its hive. I say drop a mouse into a poem and watch him probe his way out. Or walk into a poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of a poem, waving at the author's name on the shore. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with rope and torture a confession out of it. They begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. The next poem is by Ted Kuzer, and it's called Selecting a Reader. First, I would have her be beautiful and walking carefully up on my poetry at the loneliest moment of an afternoon, her hair still damp at the neck from washing it. She should be wearing a raincoat, an old one, dirty from not having money enough for the cleaners. She will take out her glasses and there in the bookstore, she will thumb over my poems. Then put the book back up on its shelf, she will say to herself. For that kind of money, I can get my raincoat cleaned. And she will. 
Not Bad Dad, Not da- Not Bad by Jan Heller Levi. I think you are most yourself when you're swimming, slicing the water with each stroke. The funny way you breathe, your mouth cocked as though you're yawning. You're neither fantastic nor miserable at getting from here to there. You won't win any medals, Dad, but you wouldn't drown. I think how different everything might have been had I judged your loving like I judge your side stroke, your butterfly, your Australian crawl. But I always thought I was drowning in that icy ocean between us. I always thought you were moving too slowly to save me when you were moving as fast as you can. Mark Halliday, The Pink Car. The pink car is in my head. It rolls calmly and calmly across the carpet in 1957 and in my head. Why is it pink? The question does not come up. The pink car is just what it is and glad so. Pink is its own color of its own being that calmly along the quiet roads. Pink not anything about sex and not anything about femininity and not anything about embarrassment or socialism. Those meanings are from outside. Whereas this pink car is not coming from an idea, it is a way of being its own self. The pink car rolls slowly along a pale green lane till it needs to go fast, then it goes very fast. While still quiet, it knows what it is. It is the pink car. Along the lanes to be what it is, It goes around hard corners and far across a wide plain and back again whenever it wants. Other cars can be all those other colors. The pink car doesn't care. They can be loud and big. The pink car doesn't care that it is why it can roll so quietly and go slow until it goes fast for a while. Other cars might honk their horns to seem big. The pink car doesn't honk and doesn't worry. It just goes along the pale green lane and around a sharp corner and down another lane to stop in a special spot. Why is the spot special? Because the pink car stopped there. Stopping quiet, but ready to go. To go and be the pink car, which is all at once. And when will I, when can I, ever be the man implied by that sedan? The last one is Acting by Susan Cleary. I most remember the class where we lie on our backs on the cold floor eyes closed, listening to a story set in tall grasses, a land of flash floods. Ten babies slept in a wagon as a stream, risen from nothing, trampled like white horses toward them. We heard the horses, pulling their terrible silence. Then he asked us to open our eyes. Our teacher took from his pocket an orange square, dropped it. This had wrapped one of the babies. This was found after the water receded. I remember the woman with the red hair, kneeling before the scarf, afraid to touch it. Our teacher telling her she could stop by saying, okay, good. I remember the boy named Michael, who once told me he loved me. Michael approached with tiny steps, heel to toe, as if we were measuring land. And all at once, he fell on the scarf. It could have been funny, loud, clumsy. Another context 
Another moment, it would have been ridiculous. Head down, he held the scarf to his eyes. My turn. I didn't move. I stared at the orange scarf, but not as long as I'd have liked to. For this was a class, and there were others in line for their grief. I touched it lightly with one hand, folded it into a square, a smaller square, smaller. What has lived in a life? Our teacher making up that story as he watched us lie on the dusty floor, are rising one by one to play with loss, to practice. What is lived to live? What was that desire to move through ourselves to the orange cotton agreed upon, passed from one to another? Well, thank you so much for stopping by. I truly hope you enjoyed these poems. Feel free to send me an email if you want to let me know which poem really resonated with you today. Find all my work on www.robinnorgrenstudios.blogspot.com.